Mexico City is one of the most populated cities on the planet, home to over 22 million people and rising at 7,000 feet above sea level long before it was a modern metropolis. It was the capital of New Spain for over 300 years. And before that, it was an Aztec city built on a lake. Nothing about Mexico City really makes any sense. And yet in all of its chaos and complexity, it is more vital, human and creative than many of the more modern planned cities that have tried to become utopias. A perfect place to consider the question, what is the future of cities? If I were to ask you to imagine the city of the future, what do you think about? Delivery drones, smart sensors, self-driving cars, vertical farms, city brains controlling traffic, renewable energy sources and smart grids. If there was one idea connecting all of these technologies, surely it is artificial intelligence. When we build the city of tomorrow, it's not going to be with bricks and mortar, but rather with data and algorithms. Why is data so important to understanding the future of cities? One of the most interesting stories in this area comes from an unlikely source. If you were to imagine Chile, in the early 70s, you would have been familiar with the rise of Salvador Allende, the newly elected president who'd won on a socialist platform. He'd begun nationalizing most of the country's industries and as a result, his planning department were in need of a much more modern approach using technology to basically give them the data they need to manage this complex economy. So they contacted Stafford Beer a British scientist who was an expert in this emerging field known as cybernetics. His vision was pretty radical. Basically, he wanted to use cybernetic principles to create a new way of governing the country that preserved worker autonomy and lower management. He was to build a prototype network of 500 telex machines, basically distributed across the country, that linked these enterprises with a state-controlled government computer and this bizarre control room that honestly looks straight off a set of Star Trek. One of the most curious ideas that they had was also to put these devices in every household known as algodonic meters that basically allowed every citizen to measure in real time their mood, whether it was extreme dissatisfaction on one side or total bliss on the other. In some ways, this approach was a kind of a prescient vision of a real-time IoT sensor-driven AI-powered city of the future that was not actually to come for decades later. But it also had an unusual idea at its core, which was what if you could actually measure in real time how you were serving your citizens? Although never completed, Stafford Beer's CyberSyn project raised an interesting question, which is when we're designing a city of the future, what should we optimize for? What if rather than focusing on infrastructure and capabilities, we instead looked to people and the connections between them? This was the interesting focus of the work by Jeffrey West and Louis Betancourt at the Santa Fe Institute. In their words, cities are social reactors. They're magnets for talent. And that talent in turn creates more opportunities for serendipitous connection, which becomes a kind of a cluster for knowledge and innovation. As cities grow, they follow scalable laws that not only increase things like pollution and crime, but also productivity and creativity. As Betancourt and West argue, cities can be best understood, not just as conglomerations of people, but in a sense, agglomerations of connections between people. The idea that human connections are at the very heart of any great city also shows the real problem that we currently face. The pandemic and its aftermath has conditioned us to start to challenge really the things that brought us to cities in the first place. And as we start to embrace things like social distancing, quarantine, avoiding public places and human interactions, and even remote work, we also started to disentangle the links and networks that bound us together and made us creative and productive. And this becomes important as we start to imagine not just the future of cities, but also the future of work. I think these ideas are very closely correlated. 
Because whether you're talking about a city or an organization, both of these, in my view, run on cultural operating systems. And when I say cultural operating systems, I mean the way that people interact, the way they make decisions, the way they come up with ideas, the very things that they believe in. And the cultural operating system of a city is ultimately what defines it and allows it to survive and be resilient. And it is curious, isn't it, that cities have tended to be far more resilient to crisis and chaos than organizations themselves. Mexico City is a case in point. But as we start to look for the future, we have to ask ourselves, what really makes a city a great place to live? What makes an organization a great place to work? If people don't want to come back to your office to work, the problem and the solution may not lie in the technologies you use to connect, but maybe the office itself. People may not want to come to your campus in the middle of nowhere. They want to work not in a suburb, but in a city that provides all the other things necessary to life. I guess we're never going to get our algodonic meters. But Stafford Beer was right about something, and that is the future of cities and countries is ultimately about understanding systems, complex, adaptive systems that are powered by people and culture. The future of cities is never going to be about the latest tools and technologies. It is and always will be a story of humanity and ideas and the magic that happens when civilizations and cultures collide in new and unexpected ways.